Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Curva Fix Masterclass featuring an expert panel of key thought leaders discussing use of the novel Curva Fix IM implant and the current challenges it helps to overcome in treating pelvic fragility fractures. My name is Dave Briggs, and it's my pleasure to open tonight's session. We have a truly exceptional group of outstanding speakers who will present early U.S. clinical experience with the only intramedullary device to follow natural bone shape and fill the space within curved bones, such as the pelvis, to facilitate a new approach for fragility fracture repair. Before we begin, though, one reminder, be sure to make frequent use of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us this evening, and it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's symposium, Dr. Milton Lee Chip Rout, the Dr. Andrew R. Burgess Endowed Chair and Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Texas McGovern Medical School at Houston, the Texas Trauma Institute, and Memorial Hermann Hospital, Texas Medical Center. Dr. Rout currently serves as the President of the Surgeons Council and Co-Chairman of the Quality Assurance Committee, and he's on the Medical Executive Committee at Memorial Hermann Hospital, Texas Medical Center. Dr. Rout, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, for that uh, very kind introduction, and thanks to all our attendees tonight. We have an expert panel of highly experienced orthopedic surgeons with us this evening, including uh, Dr. Matt Gardner, Dr. Josh Gary, Dr. Hank Hutchinson, and Dr. Samir Mehta. During the master class tonight, we will discuss some of the current problems and the pitfalls in fixation for pelvic fragility fractures and share more about how this novel flexible device was developed and launched by Curvafix to address some of these challenges and problems. We will also hear from the experts about early cases and patient examples where they've used the Curvafix implant in pelvic fragility fracture patients. I'd like to introduce the faculty. First, Dr. Matt Gardner. Dr. Gardner is Director of Orthopedic Trauma at the Memorial Medical Center, an orthopedic trauma surgeon at the Springfield Clinic, where he is also the co-director of the Fragility Fracture and Bone Health Clinic, and is an adjunct assistant professor in the orthopedics at Southern Illinois University. He will be sharing an overview of the surgical technique for placing the Curvafix implant. He'll also present one of his recent high-energy pelvic trauma cases where he used the implant in a geriatric patient. Dr. Josh Gary is the Chief of Orthopedic Trauma Service and an Associate Clinical Professor of the Orthopedic Surgery at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of Southern California. Prior to joining Keck, Dr. Gary was using the Curvafix implant in the RESTORE study here at UT Health Center, uh, uh, Science Center in Houston. He will be speaking this evening about using the Curvafix implant for a Y-shaped sacral fracture. Dr. Hank Hutchinson is the Director of Orthopedic Trauma at Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, an orthopedic trauma surgeon at the Tallahassee Orthopedic Clinic, and he serves on the clinical faculty of Florida State University College of Medicine. He will present one of the multiple fragility fracture cases where he's used the Curvafix implant to repair a sacral nonunion. Dr. Samir Mehta is the Chief of Orthopedic Trauma and Fracture Care and an Associate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He will present a recent case in a metastatic cancer patient with bilateral sacral fragility fractures resulting in chronic pain and disability. He used two Curvafix implants to provide effective fixation of the patient's dysmorphic upper sacral segment. A few housekeeping notes. We'll be keeping track of your questions and your panel will look forward to answering them during our live Q&A session after the case presentations. Please let us know if your question is for a particular surgeon. In addition, Steve Dimmer, Curvafix CEO will be joining the panel for any questions about the company. To get things going, I'd like to open with a short presentation on some of the challenges and problems in treating patients with pelvic fragility fractures. I'm Chip Rout uh, from here at the University of Texas Health McGovern Medical School in Houston, Texas. I work at Memorial Hermann Hospital, and these are my disclosures. Tonight, of, uh, of course, we'll be uh, discussing the curve fix. I work uh, here in the Texas Medical Center. It's a pretty vast area in our hospitals, that one over there on the lower left, the uh, orange the orange roof buildings, and, and just right next to us is another level one trauma center. Here we serve 7 million people in the Metro Houston area. 
This is a team that I work with, a really dedicated group of people. As you know, it takes a huge village to provide uh, high quality trauma care to a large metro area. And this is a group that uh, really does a lot of hard work. So I'm uh, really grateful to be a part of this team. We'll talk uh, in this session mostly about just the problems. This is one of my recent patients, and I think you can understand one of the problems we'll probably touch on already just by trying to see the bone in this uh, radiograph is uh, pelvic injuries in senior patients. We're going to just really focus in my session on the problems and the issues and stick to about four of them. And then I think you'll find the other people that are following behind are going to deal with the solutions to it. But I'd like to just highlight some of the problems that I think most of you may be aware of, but we'll certainly get into it. Probably the, the first thing to think about is just the host and the overall situation. Um, senior patients have a real spectrum of functionality. And their ability and their agility and their activity, I think all of y'all are very aware of the, the real wide range of this and how we have to adjust and treat uh, our patients accordingly. These aren't young, uh, usually uh, high energy traumatic events. These are usually um, people that are in a, some form of constrained living environment. They may or may not have the ability and the agility and the mobility that we all seek. And so it really is important to understand the, the host and their support system and the safety nets that they have, as well as just uh, other issues. I just uh, want to look at this picture. This picture is of uh, two of my mother's uh, very good friends. One, um, you can see uh, broker uh, pelvis and had a surgery and uh, has been doing quite well. Uh, the other uh, broke her pelvis and had an unstable pelvis, but was uh, told she didn't need a surgery. She's been in a chair for about six months at this point. She wasn't getting better. And I'll just tell you for the last eight years, she's been stuck in the chair uh, without a good quality lifestyle. So I, I, fixing and stabilizing unstable pelvic ring injuries, I would say is pretty critical and borne out just by the tale of these two, uh, two individuals. But they all come with medical comorbidities of some variety, uh, hypertension, diabetes, you know all of these things. And I think the things that tend to steer us or really make surgeons sort of wander away is not just the bone quality or the host issues, but sometimes the prior surgeries, the scarring, the hernias that they might have, like this is a pretty massive hernia. And you can see the anticoagulation that this patient is on for his other conditions is really caused him to have at least some ecchymosis problems. So all of these things go into complicating the host. We've talked a little bit about the bimodal distribution of pelvic ring and pelvic injuries in people. These are usually now low energy falls and things like that. These are typically low drama events. You know, young people have these high, high drama events where they wrecked their motorcycle and they were found 200 yards away and they flew through the air and all these things. But typically elders are just tough people. Sometimes they're impaired with their communication abilities for other things in life, uh, just uh, living a, the privilege of living a long time. And then we have the bone quality issues that we talked about. So I would just say it's a really important uh, to make sure we have an awareness that pelvic ring injuries and other types of pelvic fractures can occur in these patients and they can be unstable. Probably awareness of instability or awareness of these injuries is, is one of the problems that we face in, in today's world. I'm also just gonna highlight, I think the two uh, types of fractures that these patients uh, tend to get. Uh, the one that you're probably most familiar with is just the pelvic ring injury. And almost all of these, uh, luckily for these patients are typically stable fracture patterns, but we have to make sure that they are stable. And the easiest way to do that is to just do a physical examination to assess ring instability. Typically these patients with ring instability will be very much more symptomatic than usual. They won't be able to find comfort. They may not even want to talk to you. They don't want to roll. They don't want to breathe. And the imaging may or may not be uh, reassuring to us. We, we tend to see a lot of physicians that will say, well, it, I think it must be stable because I don't want to operate on it. But it, it would be smart to just examine it and do a compression exam. And you can see uh, just by a little bit of compression on the pelvis, you'll be able to reveal instability. If you don't have a good sense of this with your physical exam, you can also just apply a binder or apply a pelvic circumferential sheet 
and you'll be able to see the revealing of the instability, a fairly simple thing to do. So making the diagnosis is uh, crucial uh, to helping the patients get on the right track from a treatment standpoint. The other thing is, is if the radiographs really aren't satisfying to you, you can use volume rendered images from the CT scan like this one. This patient, it was pretty hard to see her fractures until we used the volume rendered imaging. The volume rendered imaging was very revealing for seeing this. And then of course, we can supplement it with the surface rendered images that give us a little bit better idea. I think it's interesting when you look at the surface rendered images to understand what you're seeing. Look, look at the right-sided uh, sacral ala on this patient. Her bone quality is so poor in her right ala that the computer uh, software program has rubbed it out and just exposed it as cancellous bone. So we have to be a little bit careful of what we're looking at when these computer programs give us this information so that we know exactly what we're seeing. And we have to correlate with the volume rendered images and the surface rendered images, and then also the axial images. The axial images, if you look at this lady's axial image, you'll be able to see why the software package thought that that ala on the right side wasn't there is because her cortical bone of her anterior ala on her right side is really uh, less dense than her left side, the injured side. You can also see her iliac fracture, the sacroiliac disruption, and you can even see her sacral crush on the left side as well, the displacement of the sacral side uh, as well. So the CT axial images, the coronals and sagittals all give us further specific details of the injury to help us plan, just like we should for young adults, but even more sensitive for the elders as a result of their bone quality. You can also see at the second sacral level, the, the morphology of the sacrum at that site so we can have a really accurate plan if we plan to reduce and stabilize this. And then you can see the, 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 the density of the parasympathetic bone. Uh, a lot of these patients will have different uh, conditions. You can also see how her acetabulum relates to her femoral neck, things like that, her body habitus, all types of details come with the axial CTs, as you know. So that would be pelvic ring injuries where you have two areas involved and you have instability that is typical for ring instability or not. And then probably the one that's the most missed fracture or the ones that at least I see over the course of my career that come to me as delayed diagnosis or patients with bilateral sacral fractures with U, H, Y, and backwards Y patterns. These don't often involve the ring unless it's a Y or backwards Y or H, but the U patterns spare the ring. The patients have usually fallen. They're complaining of low back pain. The radiographs may or may not be apparent to the physicians. CT scans are usually not obtained and the diagnosis is missed until there's some type of displacement or deformity that causes the patient to have the inability to mobilize or they start having bowel and bladder symptoms as a result of the kyphotic displacement of the upper sacrum into the canal. So uh, it would be great to uh, improve the awareness of this throughout our uh, professional uh, colleagues. Uh, and if nothing else, we could just alert them to the paradoxical inlet where we see an inlet appearance of the upper sacrum as a result of the kyphotic displacement of the bilateral sacral fracture with a transverse limb, the so-called U-shaped sacral fracture. The AP image is directed normally, and so the rest of the pelvis looks like an AP, but as a result of the displacement of the upper sacrum due to the fracture there, we get a kyphotic displacement, and so the the posterior ring looks like an inlet and the rest of the ring looks like an AP. A really good thing to teach your emergency room colleagues or people that are screening patients, uh, family medicine doctors, et cetera, really important thing for them to see. Because it's kind of hard sometimes, even if you get a fairly good true lateral view to see it. But again, if you do get outlet imaging, a lot of times you can see the essentially intussusception of the spine and the upper sacrum onto the sacrum itself. Again, just radiographic um, findings that may or may not be obvious as a result of the osteopenia or osteoporosis or bone quality issues. But again, um, you can understand why a lot of these get delayed in diagnosis. Nevertheless, we use the axial images to sort out the details. You can understand why some of these come with neurology and they're present with neurological findings like this patient's did. 
And then you can see we have a third problem, which is just people trying to help and do things that they may or may not know how to do. And so a lot of devices have been you know, created, but they don't really address the problem. And then a lot of times people don't understand what they're doing. And you can see here, when we don't put implants into the bone, it really doesn't work very well. So regardless of what we use, whether it's uh, screw or curvafix or other devices, we have to put them in the bone. Another problem uh, with treatment is our colleagues are trying to help. And uh, if you know how to just squirt bone cement into bone and it worked for the spine, then maybe it'll work for the sacrum, but it really doesn't. And so if you have colleagues that are smearing bone glue onto the surface of the pubic ramus percutaneously, or they're cramming it into the ala and putting it in there, this is really not gonna help the patient. And then we're gonna have trouble. I, I can't really get an implant through uh, this bone cement. So I would, if you have colleagues doing this and then they expect you to bail them out, you might want to have some conversations about that and avoid that. But I, I think this is a real, I think the diagnostic problem, the citing uh, or identifying the instability or identifying the U-shaped fractures is one thing, but this, this is even worse. So the treatment problems bleed over into us as well. So if we can identify the injury, we can identify its instability and we can get ourselves to that point. Now we have to deal with reduction and we have to deal with fixation and we have to deal with the imaging of this poor bone quality and then the implants that would, we would use to sort it out. So the planning becomes really, I think planning is always uh, very important, but the planning gets incredibly important with this. Typically, we just have standard uh, straight implants. Uh, up until now, with the Curvafix, we have rounded or curved implants that can uh, accommodate these curved pathways. But up until now, we've just been uh, stuck with uh, straight, trying to put straight implants into curved uh, structures of bone, which uh, in some situations may work, but in some situations may not work so well. So you can see we can solve the problem for people with their ring injuries. We can address the sites of instability and we can uh, put these devices in that may or may not be sufficient for what we're doing. And we can verify post-optively that we have uh, safe screws well located what we wanted, where we wanted them to be. But then we have a fourth problem, which is um, hanging on to what we've got. And, we see that uh, even when we think we've got things in pretty good shape, we have uh, fixation failures. So um, with that, uh, I think we'll uh, get started uh, with our uh, next group of speakers. But before we transition to them, I just want to leave you with these uh, four problems. I promised you four problems. and I've actually uh, snuck a few others in. I uh, want to make sure you remember the host issues. We, we have a spectrum of hosts and they have a lot of issues, but uh, the thing that we're trying to deal with the curve of fix is just the bone quality and the bone morphology. Um, we don't want to forget when we're taking care of these patients that once we do get them fixed, we want to make sure that we make sure they get on the proper medications and the diet and the supplements that they uh, may or may not be uh, on at the time and, and what have caused their problems. So we don't want to forget about our bone health clinics. We want to help with the uh, improving the diagnostic ability of our peers so that these patients don't get missed. And that's, that's education, that's physical exam, that's increasing awareness. And then again, our, our own clinical aggression. Uh, so many times you get busy and um, things sort of take over and it's just another uh, someone that fell down and you don't think it's too much. But I would, I would Im implore you to be aggressive with your clinical um, seeking disease and not hoping for wellness. Uh, typically, it's best to do a full workup and make sure you haven't missed something so that these patients, especially the U patterns, don't progress on to caught equina symptoms. And again, sort out the ring injuries if they're stable or unstable, just because they fell doesn't mean they're not unstable. It's always great just to rule out instability and you can move on with closed management or identify instability so you can move on with stable early treatment. And then again, uh, the bilateral sacral should be the herald of the U pattern or the Y pattern, the H pattern, and you can uh, learn more about that as, as we go. And then the, with the management, the imaging is so important. It's really important to get the accurate reduction and stable fixation. And 
What we're here to learn about tonight is the um, precision that's demanded for these patients and these newer the new implant that we'll be talking about tonight that gives us the ability uh, to uh, treat these patients and to make sure that their conduits of bone that demand the stability can get the implant that they need for that. Now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Matthew Gardner, one of the 12 surgeons now using the CurveFX IM implant in the United States. Take it away, Dr. Gardner. That was a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Uh, my name is Matt Gardner. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon in Springfield, Illinois, with Southern Illinois University. Um, I'm going to continue the discussion uh, with a high-energy pelvic trauma in a geriatric patient. Uh, the objectives today, we want to kind of go through the, the basics of the implant. I think we'll probably hear about this a lot. Um, I'm going to review a video taken from a cadaver on the technique of placing the device. And then I have a case presentation uh, with a high energy geriatric pelvic fracture patient. So just to start kind of the basics of the implant, um, it's, it's good to know, uh, you know, diameters and lengths uh, before you get started with this. Uh, so I think one of the, the key points with the implant is uh, understanding uh, where your curve starts um, and that's going to kind of play into to how uh, you start your placement of this device. So uh, keep in mind that the, the, the near end of this section or the, the section that's going to attach to your uh, insertion device uh, does not curve. It's about three and a half centimeters long. So you have to think about that when you're placing that uh, into an area that you're, you're trying to curve. You want it to be straight for the first almost four centimeters when you're placing this in. Um, the diameter of that is a little bit bigger than the diameter of the uh, shaft of this, which is eight millimeters. And then at the very end is a screw tip. And I talk to my residents all the time. I show them a screw and I point at the threads and I say, what are these? And they all say threads. And I say, no, this is a ramp. Uh, this is uh, the, the mechanism that allows a rotational motion to translate into linear motion. So you're, you're turning this screw and the threads are driving this from one end of the bone to the other. So in this situation, the threads on this end um, are simply to drive the implant from one uh, area of the pelvis to the next. So I'm going to show this video here now of the implant. Uh, I'm gonna let it play at first um, and kind of get through the, the placement uh, posteriorly. Um, you can watch that, and then I'm going to kind of go back and explain everything. So I'll just let this go. All right, so let me grab a hold of this. So you can kind of see uh, that this, uh, this wire snaking through the, uh, the sacrum and the pelvis. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through and uh, explain this. So, so this this insertion device here is is kind of big and gnarly, and I actually uh, don't use it. The incision uh, gets a lot bigger when you're trying to get this through the soft tissue, and I think it's it's difficult to get through um, the soft tissue down to the bone uh, like it would be needed. So uh, I actually don't use this uh, guide. But placing your wire uh, again, you want to place this in about. Uh, four centimeters. Uh, if you remember, the, the beginning of your implant is the straight part. It's 36 millimeters in length. Uh, so there's going to be no curve in that portion of the screw. Uh, so this is going across the SI joint. And when I'm making my start point, uh, I try to start in a different position uh, than I would with a normal straight screw. Uh, and that's going to allow me uh, to put a curve in the implant. And the curve in the implant is what uh, gives uh, stability to what you're trying to fix. So we start with our reamer. You can see that going over the wire in about three centimeters. And then this piece of metal here, uh, the, the guide wire that you're using to get across the pelvis uh, is fairly flimsy. It's a little more uh, uh, flimsy than, than a typical ball tip guide wire. Um, so putting this piece uh, into the bone uh, gives you a little bit more uh, power when you're you're malleting this through. So there's, there's less of the wire to bend when you're placing this. So you can see this, uh, this wire, it's got about a 30 degree bend uh, past the ball tip and you can use that to work your way 
uh, around the sacrum. Uh, you can see taking orthogonal views, making sure that you're not getting into any uh, neurovascular structures. And I'll tell you from experience, you can definitely feel the difference between cortical bone, cancellous bone, and being out. Um, and so uh, if you get a chance doing this in a cadaver, I, I would recommend that you do all three things so you can kind of get used to the feel of that happening. And so we get the ball tip uh, across to the other side of the pelvis. And then you can see our sequential reaming. So in patients with bad bone, you don't necessarily need to ream as high uh, to go uh, above the diameter of the nail. And people with better bone, I strongly recommend it. It's very difficult to get uh, the device in if you're not reaming up high enough. But as you'll see in my uh, example, sometimes with bad bone, uh, aggressive reaming is not uh, a good thing to do. So you can see this coming around, we're reaming again, and then oh, let me go back. So this is the, uh, the switching tube. So you can see we've got our ball tip wire in right now, and the Curvifix implant cannot go over that because the ball tip needs to come out. Uh, so you can see this a uh, little bit more radio opaque sleeve going over that wire, and then the next frame that being exchanged for a straight wire. So you get the straight wire in, and then your implant can go across the pelvis. And then it goes in, and then you can advance it uh, as deep as you want. You can countersink or not. Uh, I've stopped countersinking most of the time. I'm not going to say an all the time thing. And then we get uh, our posterior implant in. And then the rest of this video uh, is putting in an anterior column uh, implant. And with this, um, the start point is going to be a little bit different. I, I think the importance of the, the straight part of this uh, implant uh, is more evident with this, uh, with changing your start point. So uh, we'll see in my example um, that I wasn't able to get one of these in because I think my start point was off and it caused uh, some problems. Um, we'll move on uh, with that. Just kind of, kind of going back to the implant. Uh, again, uh, showing the diameters, the available lengths. It goes from 110 to 180 millimeters. Um, and it has a 65 millimeter uh, radius of curvature. So moving on to my patient, uh, this is a 76 year old lady. Um, maybe she shouldn't have been driving, but she pulled out in front of a truck uh, traveling at high speeds, about 55 miles an hour, and she was T-boned. So the patient sustained uh, this injury seen on the right. Uh, this is our uh, initial uh, x-ray. She has um, kind of an LC2 pelvis. Uh, I think it was trying to be windswept, but instead of uh, injuring the uh, left sacroiliac uh, joint, she ended up uh, breaking through her left acetabulum. So she had a transverse acetabular fracture. Other injuries included a splenic laceration, and she broke a few ribs. Uh, other than that, she was, she was okay. So uh, a couple of views here to kind of illustrate uh, her injuries a little bit better. This is a uh, an outlet view, and I think this shows the right uh, root fracture and the displacement there. Also shows a right iliac uh, oblique that shows the transverse fracture of the left, ac left acetabulum. <clears throat> so a couple of CT cuts uh, showing the compression style uh, injury in the sacrum. Uh, this CT shows that she has a little bit of dysmorphism. Um, I don't believe a straight screw uh, would be very easy to get in here, uh, which made this implant perfect for this situation. And then here's uh, a cut showing the injuries um, anteriorly. So the plan for this patient was to go to the operating room and place uh, three Curvifix implants, one in S1, one in the left anterior column, and run, one in the uh, right anterior column. And so this is what we ended up getting done. And so what happened here? Um, we got the uh, S1 implant in without uh, too much issue. Uh, the right anterior column screw in uh, went fairly well. And then on the left, I, I believe my start point was a little bit too anterior. So I had my, uh, my guide wire down all the way to the symphysis and then began reaming. And as the reamer hit that kind of inferior cortex of the root there, it obliterated it. Her bone quality was bad uh, and that kind of chewed up that bone. And then we ended up 
uh, with a wire that was kind of sitting out into the pelvis. And I, I didn't feel uh, too good about that. So we elected to, to not place that screw, which was kind of disappointing for me. Uh, but looking back at this, uh, I think there's some, some issues with the geriatric patient uh, with poor bone quality um, that I would do different in this situation. So uh, with the poor bone quality, I probably am not going to be as aggressive with my reaming. If I uh, get into a situation where the reamer stops, um, I'm probably not, first of all, not going to have uh, the trigger down all the way the whole time. Um, I'll be pushing this reamer through uh, with uh, very few uh, spins of the reamer. If it gets caught up, um, I would go in reverse or I would try to push it through. And again, I'm not going to ream up to an 8.5 like I would in a patient with uh, with really good bone. I would probably get the first reamer in and then use the implant uh, to get through this uh, without uh, removing the bone. I, I think uh, the bone can be a little bit smaller than the implant if you don't ream it too much. If you place it in there, uh, you may get small micro fractures in that. Um, but I, I think you'll get decent healing in that situation. So we were able to get two implants in this patient. Um, and uh, other than uh, the left uh, root, I think everything went well. So here are our post-operative films. We got these immediately after the surgery just to make sure uh, we were happy with our implants and not concerned about anything being in the joint, even though we did that also in the operating room. So in these views, uh, I wasn't completely sure that uh, everything was out of the joint. So we got CT scans and you can see on both of these cuts, these were the closest that came to the joint. Uh, that implant is sitting uh, right on the subchondral bone uh, and out of the joint. So I was satisfied with that. Uh, this patient actually uh, ended up in a different state. So uh, we finally got her to come back, but it, it turned out she was in our hospital at our rehab facility for at least a month. So I went back to the physical therapy notes just to see how this patient did. My, my goal of, of doing this surgery is to take the patients who have these injuries that we, we used to not fix, uh, who really couldn't walk and see if we can get them up and get them ambulating right away. So I was really happy with uh, how she did going through these notes. On post-operative day three, you can see, uh, according to the note, the physical therapist said the patient is able to stand and shift weight from one foot to the other. Uh, at post-operative day eight, the patient walked 22 feet. And then post-op day 15, I put this in there just for the video coming up next. You'll see this patient's personality. She's, she's very entertaining and very interesting. Uh, and then on post-op day 25, I think she left on day 27, uh, the note said the patient did well with stairs. So within one month, this patient who uh, most likely wouldn't have been able uh, to get up and down stairs, uh, maybe wouldn't have been ambulating, uh, was actually doing stairs and doing well with it. So. At three months post-op, uh, we finally got the patient to make the drive to come see us. Uh, she came in, she had no complaints. She said she's ready to uh, get outside and start taking care of her violets. Uh, and she said, I'm using a walker and then said, well, I'm only using it some of the time. And there was no walker in the room. <clears throat> so I said, well, why don't you get up and uh, show me how you can walk and um, I see all these other presentations where doctors have their videos of patients walking, uh, and I very rarely do this. And after this video, I'm probably never going to do it again because it's, it's maybe the single greatest walking video of all time. I'll let you be the judge. That's what they always say. Yeah, the nursing. Don't fall. Don't fall. Don't fall. Don't fall. Yeah. Okay. All right, come back. Wait a minute. Well, I need a clipper for my chips. I need a scissor too. I need a clipper. You can add a scissor. Why would I? This is great. I need all three of them. So this patient is, is doing great. And honestly, I, I don't know that I'm going to get her to come back and see me, uh, but this video is priceless. And at three months, she's, she's walking uh, without any assistive device uh, and doing great. Um, so 
I, I think I think I've I've done uh, some good for this patient, and I think uh, we can certainly do some good in the future for for these patients with these fragility pelvic fractures. Um, thank you. Thanks, Matt. That was a, a great case, and thanks for sharing. So I want to talk about a Y-shaped sacral fracture uh, in an elderly patient after a fall. So this is a 68-year-old female. Uh, she had a low-energy fall in the shower and presented with an isolated uh, injury uh, to her pelvis. Uh, she previously ambulated without assistive devices, so she was community ambulator, did not require cane or walker, uh, and she has minimal, uh, minimal medical comorbidities. Uh, so overall, very healthy. Uh, the, the plain x-rays, uh, you don't see much. I think one thing that's notable that's common in these patients, you can see the distension uh, in the bowel gas. She's presenting a couple days from her injury. So a lot of times these injuries can get missed uh, or seen at outside places and not treated. Uh, and then they can come in with, with issues with going to the restroom, both urinary uh, retention uh, and, uh, and issues with constipation. And, and you can see some of that on her x-ray here. And so we got a CT scan uh, like we do for most of these injuries uh, to help identify the injury. She had pain posteriorly and some in the front. And when you look at her axial CT cuts, here as you come down, you see some arthrosis in her spine, but really, you know, you don't see much. And we'll go back through this uh, in her sacrum. It's hard to see. And then she's got some non-displaced fractures in the front of her ring as well. So as we come back through this, her sacrum, she has bilateral sacral fractures uh, in zone two, uh, and they're fairly minimally displaced, but she's had some significant pain. You can see them there on that cut. And then as you come to the front of the ring on the left side, uh, she's got minimally displaced fractures of the superior and inferior ramus. And then I think when you look at this sagittal view, that's, that's really telling. Anytime you see bilateral sacral fractures, uh, you want to look for that. And you can see a transverse component here uh, between S1 and S2. And like we talked about earlier with the bowel and bladder, um, if you look, you can see her bladder in the soft tissue shadow and it's very full. So it's, a, it's something we commonly see in these patients uh, with pain. And, and I think it's really an indication of, of what's going on and, uh, and, and surgery can help them with stabilization. So we've identified here a Y-shaped uh, pattern. She's got a U-shaped pattern in the back and then extension uh, into the left hemipelvis. And so I, I've gotten fairly aggressive with these. Uh, over time, if they're having pain and not mobilizing well, I do think uh, I do think stabilization helps them uh, to move. And so for her, we did this supine on an OSI flatbed, uh, and she had a central sacral bump. I think the one other thing that's notable, uh, if we go back on her CT, is we like transsacral transiliac fixation for these because we're really trying to stabilize the the central sacral segment uh, and the in the entire upper body and spine back to bilateral lower extremities, but here she's got some dysmorphism. So there's not really a pathway for a transsacral transiliac screw in the upper sacral segment at S1 above the transverse component. And so, you know, that in the past may be an indication if you're doing surgery, you can just try bilateral SI style screws, but it may also be an indication for lumbar pelvic fixation. And so, you know, I, I would say before we saw this implant that uh, can actually perform in four dimensions. Uh, you, you, you really didn't have a pathway to get all the way across. And so here I started up at the front of her ring just because it was uh, non-displaced and I did want to add stability. My starting point was a little too low. So I just then adjusted the starting point a little bit more cranial and used a, a more standard 7.3 millimeter screw uh, at the left hemi pelvis. And so this was put in first, and then we come to address the back of the ring, and, and we, the curva fix here allows us to be transiliac, transsacral, and you can see us getting the starting point, and here using the flexible ball tip guide wire to go across both fractures, and then and be able to do this really, and you know, you've got to think in four dimensions here uh, to get across in a transsacral, transiliac fashion that I couldn't have done with a standard screw. And there you can see the curve on the outlet imaging, here you can see the rumor uh, being able to penetrate the other joint in this osteoporotic bone. And you can see us reaming now as we go across. Here we just needed to penetrate the far cortex, so we did temporarily switch to a, a bigger guide wire from a 7.3 set. But here comes a rod screw coming in. You can see us avoiding both of the foramina and then coming across in a transsacral, transiliac fashion. 
And this would not have been possible with a standard screw. So you can see on these final images with fluoro here, and we'll go over the CTs in a second, you can see that now in this dysmorphic segment at S1 above a transverse component, you can see an outlet image here where we've been able to safely go across that corridor. And you can see an inlet image here. And so, you know, I think this was a real advantage and something I couldn't have done before the curva fix. And I think you may have been just trying two SI style screws in the upper sacral segment. Uh, and then if you had issues, you're looking at lumbar pelvic fixation. Uh, but I think this was a, a really nice solution uh, for, for a problem we couldn't deal with percutaneously before. And so here is her post-operative uh, CT scan. And, and you'll see on the images here, we were able to navigate this corridor uh, with the rod screw and curva fix. And she was neurovascularly intact post-operatively with no issues. Uh, and then we had a screw up front. So really, really pleased uh, with the surgical result here and what we were able to do um, that, that we wouldn't have been able to do before. And you can see just coming through it again, there's a the rod screw starting. We're able to be anterior to each of the foramina. It's a little hard to see with the scatter, but then transsacral transiliac and also safe for L4 and L5 behind the, behind the uh, anterior aspect of the lateral sacrum on both sides. So really a uh, nice solution uh, for this problem that we didn't have. And, you know, she did well, did very well clinically. I made her weight bearing as tolerated uh, with a walker uh, early on. I did not want to restrict her. Um, there's a ton of force on these injuries because you essentially have the entire body, upper body uh, and spine attached to this U-shaped component. I do think she slightly displaced a little bit, and you can see that on the outlet image before we had that arc going up, but clinically she healed without symptoms. Uh, and at three months, she was walking without pain, uh, had no issues and was largely back to her prior function. So really, really pleased with the clinical result and the patient was as well. And I think the take home points were the rod screw allowed transiliac transsacral fixation in S1 of a dysmorph. Um, and, and this would not have been something that would have been possible uh, with screws that were straight only. Uh, and then there are really, uh, there's a ton of force in these U-shaped sacral fractures. So you can see here, even with some stabilization, she might've displaced just slightly, but I think the, you know, being aggressive earlier on with these fractures, especially when patients aren't mobilizing well, uh, and they often show up to you late, I think, I think stabilizing these uh, is a good thing, especially for these elder patients where mobility is such a key to life. Thank you very much. My name is Hank Hutchinson. I'd like to thank Dr. Rout for allowing me to participate in this webinar and also a uh, nice presentation, Dr. Gary. I'd like to follow up with that with my presentation of the use of Curvifix for a sacral insufficiency fracture. I'm in Tallahassee, Florida, a member of the Tallahassee Orthopedic Clinic. My case is a 70-year-old female who sustained a ground-level fall uh, six weeks prior to seeing me and was treated at an outside facility about an hour and a half away. Um, prior to this fall, she was a community ambulator, used a walker occasionally, but typically a cane, uh, was able to get up and get around and participate with her family. Um, she was treated conservatively by uh, another orthopedic surgeon, and after she was unable to ambulate after six weeks of conservative treatment, was then referred to me. Uh, her past medical history is significant for cirrhosis, osteoporosis, and uh, moderate obesity. Uh, on exam, uh, she was noted to be neurovascularly intact. She had no anterior pelvic pain, either on palpation or with weight bearing but she had disabling left posterior pelvic pain with weight bearing, which was requiring her to be in a wheelchair. And she was having pain while at, at rest and while rolling around in the bed as well, and was quite uncomfortable and had been for the last six weeks, uh, despite attempting to rest and recover. CT scan obtained uh, six weeks prior by the uh, prior facility does show sacral insufficiency fractures on the left sacral ala. Uh, CT scans are shown here and I've highlighted the fractures. 
uh, as they can be seen. Uh, typically, this is something that is treated conservatively in the hospital with attempts to mobilize uh, or as an outpatient. And if patients are able to mobilize, they can be treated without surgery. And that's typically what's done uh, in my practice. However, this patient uh, continued to have significant pain and inability to bear weight at six weeks post-injury, uh, even disabling pain. These are x-rays from the office and AP pelvis, uh, which shows uh, some calcification in the parasympathetic region, obviously due to her body habitus. It's very difficult to discern anything from the sacrum. Here's her inlet view that shows no significant uh, displacement in the posterior pelvic ring. And her outlet view, uh, which shows similar findings. Um, so treatment options at this point, uh, discuss this with her, like I do most patients, what they should be. Um, the need for additional Im imaging, um, we discussed uh, possibly repeating the CT scan, getting a bone scan, getting an MRI. I think at this point, due to her clinical findings of severe pain that were localized to the left side of the posterior pelvis that was causing her an inability to bear weight, um, and a prior CT scan showing the insufficiency fracture, that we did not need any more additional imaging at this point. We could continue conservative treatment, but this takes significant amount of time and continued immobility and all the things that go along with old folks being immobile. Osteoporosis treatment, there are some studies talking about medical treatment of osteoporosis for non-unions or sacral insufficiency fracture. This does take a significant period of time. As someone who's a marginal ambulator, uh, pre-injury, uh, this would likely prevent her from walking significantly in the future if we would give it significant time. We talked about the option of posterior surgical stabilization and that there is a potential for quicker mobility, pain relief versus the risks of anesthesia and surgery. Uh, we had a long discussion with both her and her family, and they decided they wanted to proceed with surgical stabilization of her posterior pelvis. The options at that point uh, that we all know who do this for a living are screws, plates, and, and now the curve affix. Um, we talked about the device specifically and um, agreed to proceed with this. So this was scheduled as an outpatient the next week. Uh, she came into our hospital uh, as an outpatient. And uh, this is her in the operating room, supine position. Um, CRM images I'll show you. Uh, those of us who instrument the sacrum, you know, typically we're gonna start with an AP and work between the inlet and outlet views. Now I've got several shots here, uh, primarily inlet views showing the passing of the curve affix, which I'm sure is similar to what has been presented in previous talks. The starting point on the lateral view, uh, you can typically start much more anterior and inferior, which enables you to get a good curve in the implant. As the device is passed, you can see there's the tool which allows you to advance it in, in a curved fashion. The introducer is actually inside the ilium right there. And then using fluoroscopy and guiding the wire with a mallet, you're able to advance it across the sacrum and across the contralateral ilium. Uh, typically in older osteoporotic patients, I've found that it can be difficult to get purchased in the contralateral ilium if, if there is a good corridor for a straight screw. This is measuring for the length of the screw, reaming over the guide wire, and placing the implant over the guide wire, the uh, straight guide wire, which was swapped out before the screw was placed. Uh, this is advancing it to the contralateral, contralateral ilium. Uh, there was surprisingly good purchase at this point, and the, as the screw uh, compressed the back of the pelvis, this is our final inlet view with the C-arm right here, an AP pelvis, and the outlet view. Um, so those are all my intraoperative shots. Um, she got up, went home that afternoon. Um, this is our post-op AP showing appropriately positioned implant with a good curve in the implant. You can see it's well contained within the sacrum on the inlet view with no violation of the sacrum anteriorly or posteriorly. You can see it's well in between the L5 uh, S1 end plate and well above the S1 foramen. 
the interesting thing about this patient is, uh, you know, we went and saw her after surgery and she felt immediately different and more stable. Um, you know, she didn't get up and dance, but she couldn't get up and dance before the surgery either. So, uh, but she did have significant pain relief. She was able to ambulate uh, with a walker, which she had not been able to do uh, before the surgery. Uh, and at two weeks when we saw her in the office, she was almost back to her baseline of getting around with the cane and the walker uh, occasionally, uh, and she was able to sleep comfortably. This is her at seven weeks, the AP pelvis, which shows similar finding, no, no change in position of the implant, no signs of loosening or lucency. Uh, there's been no, no change in the curve of the implant. And she continued to progress well, and at seven weeks was back to her baseline uh, pre-fall. So I think for me and my experience, the curve of fig fix advantages for sacral insufficiency fractures are that it can be done as a minimally invasive outpatient procedure. Um, this candidate was not, this patient was not a candidate for our ambulatory surgery center, but had she been, I would have likely done it there. Uh, does allow, it can allow for significant pain relief in the appropriate patients. Uh, you are able to use it with abnormal sacral anatomy. Uh, can provide stability even in osteoporotic bone. Uh, safe when appropriate imaging is possible, uh, just like any sort of iliosacral screws. Uh, should be used with appropriate treatment and counseling for osteoporosis as indicated. So I think it's important to remember as orthopedic surgeons, sometimes we're the first people to talk to people about osteoporosis. And this can't be a replacement for that counseling and treatment that needs to occur either from their primary care physician or their endocrinologist. And it can be used in multiple other corridors in the pelvis. Thank you. Thanks, Hank. That was a great case. Uh, hopefully, uh, this case will also uh, elucidate some uh, points around uh, pelvic ring fixation uh, as we talk about uh, curve fix in this particular patient. So, um, our patient's a 70 year old female with a history of metastatic pancreatic cancer that was recently diagnosed. She's on uh, chemotherapeutic agents, along with participating in a clinical uh, trial for a drug therapy. She's also already received radiation therapy. She has a history of chronic cervical spine and low back pain that's been longstanding and has been treated conservatively by um, spine surgeons. She has had no history of acute trauma to her pelvis or uh, acetabular region. She presents to the ortho spine team uh, with acute new onset, what she was calling low back pain. They of course obtained an MRI, uh, which revealed bilateral fragility fractures with the left being uh, more prevalent on the MRI than the right. And you can see it on these imaging studies here. Prior to her acute new onset low back pain. Uh, she was using a cane to ambulate, and now she was forced to use a walker uh, as a result of uh, the significant increase in her uh, pain, uh, particularly with ambulation. There was no concern on her imaging, uh, both from the radiologist, as well as on our review, and from her oncologist, that these were met metastatic fractures, but rather more likely uh, bilateral insufficiency fractures secondary to some of the chemotherapeutic agents that she had received, along with the radiation therapy. She was then uh, referred to our orthopedic trauma clinic, uh, where we continued conservative care for her, given that the this was a relatively new onset diagnosis. We continued her on the walker. Uh, we added vitamin D to her uh, regimen. And in discussion with her oncologist, we altered her chemotherapy by stopping her methotrexate. We did not think it wise to stop the remainder of her chemotherapeutic agents, and she had already completed a course of radiation, which wasn't, and she wasn't due for another course for some period of time. She returned after two months with increasing pain, focal to the, her lump, uh, low back, particularly over her sacrum, and further increased dependence on her walker. She was clear to discern that this was distinct and different from her pre-existing chronic low back pain, and having had prior exacerbations of low back pain, this was quite different to her. And she noted that as her disease process was uh, fatal, she wanted to ice skate with her kids again, or her, she wanted to ice skate again, 
and also walk with her grandkids. Uh, this was really important to her uh, as uh, she could see the um, sort of the end of her life uh, coming forward. So uh, uh, in discussion with her at length and her family, along with working with our oncologists, uh, we chose to go down the road of a, a sort of a palliative care treatment for her in terms of uh, giving her some pain relief and trying to stabilize her posterior pelvic ring such that she could be a little bit more functional um, as she tried to manage through her pancreatic uh, cancer. Um, in looking at her CT scan, um, we discussed posterior pelvic ring fixation for her, for her bilateral insufficiency fractures, which had failed conservative treatment. Um, uh, we were looking at potentially doing bilateral upper sacral segment screws, uh, as well as a transiliac transsacral S2 screw. Uh, I did not feel that I was able, I would be able to get a single screw in the upper sacral segment from uh, the left to the right side, given the uh, anatomy of her uh, upper sacral segment. Uh, it was my opinion that I could probably at best do bilateral S1 screws and then a transiliac transsacral S2 screw. However, with the uh, opportunity to use the Curvafix device and in discussion with her, we elected to proceed with uh, a single upper sacral segment screw along with a single uh, S2 screw that would be transiliac transsacral. And so we took her to the operating room. Um, this is the starting point for the upper sacral segment screw that would be transiliac transsacral. Again, one of the advantages or opportunities with the Curvafix device is that it allows you uh, to not be quite as precise with your starting point um, because of the ability to, as you can see in this image, uh, get your guide wire uh, around the sacral tunnel. So this is the S1 tunnel you can see here. And you can see that I've been, I'm able to pass my bent guide wire uh, around the S1 tunnel uh, on the near side. Uh, you can see the lateral view there with the wire posterior to the iliocortical density and anterior to the S1 tunnel. I can then pass my wire further uh, uh, laterally uh, across midline uh, over the uh, opposite side S1 tunnel, approaching the SI joint on the far side, and then exchange using an exchange tube to then pass my uh, wire that I would ream over. Here you'll see an, uh, an image of the upper sacral segment screw uh, in position, and then uh, an image of us passing uh, and starting to pass our S2 screw. The one thing that I did learn from this case was that due to the size of the screw, particularly on the outlet image, uh, the size of the screw limits the visualization um, of the S2 component. So the S1 screw uh, blocked my ability to see my uh, uh, S1, S2 wire. So my S1 screw was so wide that the S2 wire was uh, blocked on my um, uh, inlet view. So uh, I would say that one thing that I learned from this was that if you are going to be placing um, upper sacral, an upper sacral segment screw and an S2 screw, to pass the wires first and then pass your screws. We did this as an outpatient procedure. Uh, she was neurologically intact postoperatively. We discharged her home. Weight bearing is tolerated with her walker with really no restrictions. And her VTE prophylaxis as well as her pain medications were per her oncologist. We did obtain a, a post-op CT prior to her discharge home from uh, the PACU. Uh, and you can see a safe passage of the upper sacral segment screw on the left, as well as uh, the S2 screw uh, below. She returned to clinic three weeks, status post or percutaneous transiliac transsacral uh, 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 fixation of her bilateral sacral insufficiency fractures. And you can see from her history that was obtained by not myself, but my PA, uh, that she was doing well. She was happy with surgery. She had no pain in her pelvis status post the surgery. She was able to ambulate with the walker with improved posture. And she noted, quote, such an improvement in quality of life. The only issue that was limiting her at this point, and again, only three weeks after her surgery, was her known chronic back pain uh, that she attributed it to. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the presentations. Those are all uh, interesting situations. I, I think we've, um, you know, we certainly don't have a, a new problem. This problem has been going on for a long time. 
but uh, with the clinicians becoming more and more aware of this, it uh, certainly um, is. It's not an epidemic yet, but it's it's it certainly it certainly can be one. I'd like to just uh, ask Dr. Gardner. There was an earlier question, or you presented the the discussion of the ramus, and so uh, just a twofold question. Are there ways to mitigate that with the reamer? One of our participants asked about the mitigation of the, the, the cortical violation with the reamer, or um, would it be beneficial to have a, a more narrow diameter um, implant available that uh, is most likely in the, in the coming days? Uh, yeah. Um, I think the, the reaming in that situation um, I'm not sure that the, the diameter of the reamer was as big of a deal as uh, the location of the wire in that situation. So the wire is going to kind of bounce around as it goes uh, down the anterior column. And if it's against that poor bone, aggressive reaming, you run, you run the risk of, uh, of reaming that out. I, I think in that situation, look, looking back and, and, and you know, if, I, if I got another chance at that, um, you know, getting the reamer to that point, and if it if it stops, if it hits that cortical bone, like the, the tip is running into the bone, then I think you need to work on you know getting the the reamer to to move around that bone before uh, you're aggressively turning uh, the reamer. So some ways to do that, and some things I've done in the past with with reamers around soft tissues, put it in reverse. Um, if you feel the reamer when, when they're in reverse, they're not actually cutting anything. It's just going to be moving things out of the way. So that would be a, a way, and I haven't been able to test this yet. That would be a way to get, get past that without actually cutting the bone. Um, another thing you can do is just, just kind of tap it on the reamer and, and pushing it to try to, to get it to go around there. And in long bones, we, we try to not ream at the fracture site. And so using that same principle in this, I think, I think would help. Um, a smaller implant. Uh, I actually just today ran into a situation trying to get an anterior column screw and it wasn't at the ramus. It was, it was more around the acetabulum. There, there was no room to get uh, the device uh, across that bone without uh, the risk of kind of breaching into the, uh, the acetabulum. Um, I think in that, in that situation, there are some people that are going to have uh, corridors that are too small to get across. So a, a smaller device, I think, in those situations would help. Um, but other than, than that today, I haven't found a, a superior ramus that was, that was too small to get through there. Steve Dimmer, we, looks like you wanna make a comment. Oh, no, I was just, uh, I, I, uh, Dr. Rout, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, I think it's just kind of leading into the smaller implant, right? So uh, company has uh, developed a smaller implant. Uh, we'll be starting to test that for, for our uh, 510K submission, and we should have it available later this year. So that's uh, that was me squirming in my chair, Dr. Out. So <laughs> thank you for, for thank bringing you. that up. And I appreciate I your input into that personally. So I look forward yeah, I to could, sharing that with you. I could see that you wanted to make a comment. Dr. Gary, You you uh, your implant changed just a little bit. It didn't fail its fixation like the ones that I showed. My standard screws were failing. Yours uh, conformed a little bit. And Dr. O'Mara from Reno is asking, uh, could you maybe comment on that? And also, are there any other implant related complications that you, Dr. Gary, have encountered uh, other than some of the bone issues that we just talked about from a suboptimal starting point? Or, uh, and then maybe the entire Alaska, Dr. Hutchinson, he can comment, uh, has anyone had to take any of these out yet? So Dr. Gary, why don't you go first? Uh, that was the that was the only one I've used uh, where there was any change uh, in position of the rod screw, and and I think we were pushing it to the max. I think uh, I think a U shaped sacrum and someone with poor bone quality, uh, and letting her weight bear immediately. Uh, but I, I do think it shifted a little bit. But clinically, she well no other complications I've seen. Uh, I I would rather again have her walking. I think Hank talked about the all the complications associated with bed rest and non weight bearing in elders. I'd rather have her up and moving and she didn't collapse or, or lose any, uh, lose any space in her spinal canal that caused any issues. So, um, that, that's the only one I've seen. Uh, but I don't know that we have any alternative other than lumbar pelvic fixation that, that may try and help fix that. But that's a, uh, that's, that's a much different procedure and usually a second surgery to take it out down the line. If you're not fusing. 
Dr. Hutchinson. Hey, Chip. Um, my only experience for um, taking them out has been with cadavers, and um, it, it didn't seem to be an issue. Twist and pull, and it came out like a regular screw. Yeah, I think um, I think they were trying to see about with bone ingrowth and things like that, not not in the cadaver situation. So, Tim, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem like anyone's had, to, at least on this panel's had experience with removing them. And then uh, Dr. Conroy brings up a, a really good point, and I, I wish we had the five or six hours, Dr. Conroy, to go through all the planning, but there are actually studies that we published on the different ways to just plan, and planning for these is uh, similar for iliosacral screws. It's just the trajectory and the orientation of the osteological pathways, and we do that off the CT scans, usually the axial images. Some people are also using sagittals and coronals as well, but uh, I usually just use the axial images. The axial images are standardized so that they're true axials and not some kind of axial coronal hybrid uh, view. But um, uh, th these, we do this uh, just the same way we uh, plan for iliosacral screws uh, with the, uh, the caveat that the pathways that we're using this in, are the, especially the upper sacral segment, would be some version of a dysmorphic upper sacral segment, maybe not a really uh, terrible extreme version of dysmorphism, but one that wouldn't accept a transsacral uh, routine transsacral screw. There has to be some, uh, for no better word, uh, hump to it, uh, to the pathway. Dr. Matt, any comments about uh, specific things that you might do regarding the preoperative planning other than similar for iliosacral screws? No, it's similar to what you described, Chip, uh, really focusing on understanding my anatomy, uh, discerning between it being a dysmorphic upper sacral segment or dysmorphic, dysmorphic sacrum versus a more traditional uh, sacrum. Um, I will uh, measure what I suspect or anticipate my iliosacral screws uh, to be, understanding the difference between an iliosacral screw and a sacral screw uh, and what I want my screw to do. Um, trying to understand if my screw is going to be uh, trying to get compression, for instance, like an SI joint injury, or if it's going to be more of a static positional screw to hold uh, the sacrum in place. Uh, also understanding the kind of injury that you're managing. Uh, so the number of screws that you need to place, uh, for instance, if you had a vertical shear, you may be inclined to put uh, more than one screw in the posterior segment. Uh, if, you're, if you are addressing the anterior ring, that may change your posterior ring fixation. So I think all of those factors are important to address as you preoperatively plan uh, pelvic ring fixation, whether you're doing it percutaneous or open. I'd like to ask the panelists and I'll, uh... I'll just start with Dr. Gardner. Um, have there been um, situations where the patients have been too, uh, with such terrible bone quality that you're not able to um, land the, reliably land the, the implant either on the insertion cortex or on the exit side cortex? Are you able to have palpation for that or do you rely mostly on imaging or is it a combination of feel and planning and imaging, or how do you go about that? Or uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a combination. So uh, with the, the planning part, I'm, I'm looking at the sacrum. Is it a dysmorph or is it straight? And that's going to kind of determine how I start. If it's a, a straight standard uh, sacrum, uh -huh. I, I want to incorporate a curve into it. So I'll usually start those a little bit more anterior and a little bit inferior. Um, getting the wire across the pelvis, uh, a lot of that is feel. And up until today, I would have said uh, I haven't had any trouble steering uh, the wire uh, across the sacrum. But uh, the, the patient I did today had, had pretty poor bone quality. And, and once I got into the, the, the far part of the sacrum, uh, I wasn't able, there, there was no bone. I wasn't able to steer it, kind of get the curve to go down uh, into the direction that I, 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 had, I had planned on, um, but I was still able to get across into the, the other iliac wing and then at that point get a little bit of a curve into it. Um, so a, a lot of uh, kind of getting to that point is, is feel. You can, you can plan, but if, if the patient doesn't have good bone quality, that, that wire, the bend in it, isn't gonna capture the bone and move you into the position that you want, but you can still, uh, as long as you're getting into the, the sacroiliac joint, you can still um, get a little bit of curve from that. Dr. Hutchinson, think, how do you reliably land, land the implant? Do you use imaging or do you use a certain view? Do you use a, an 
oblique image of the posterior iliac lateral cortex, or is it palpation, or what is the technique that's used to assure that the implant is landed and not intruded? Yeah, I think it's a combination of uh, imaging. Typically, I'll use an inlet view 15 degrees over the top to see my side and 15 degrees uh, away from me on the inlet view to make sure that I've penetrated the far cortex of the ilium in combination with feel as you're tapping it across. I think you get a good feel for it with the reamer as well. Um, the ilium tends to be, and the SI joint tends to be some reliable bone for feeling uh, that location. Any other tricks or issues that uh, Dr. Mehta, any other situations that have come up during the application of the device uh, that you'd want to comment on? Uh, so I, I think uh, to, to go back to your prior question, Chip, and then I'll answer the few things I've learned. Um, I, I think we're all com relatively comfortable uh, putting ball tip guide wires in long bone fractures for intramedullary nailing. Um, the process here is not dissimilar. It's a little uncomfortable doing it in the sacrum uh, or in the anterior pelvic ring. Um, if, you, if you haven't done it before with other uh, other ways to, to sort of put a bent wire across, and but to tap it across rather than than drill it or, or using a wire driver is a, is a little different. Um, and I would say that I'm relying both on the radiographic um, fluoroscopic images that I've traditionally used, uh, along with starting to get a feel for how that wire um, behaves as it is passing through the sacrum and around the sacral tunnels. So I think. Um, I suspect that as we start to learn more about doing it this way, that we'll start to rely more on feel, but I'm still relying fairly heavily on my fluoroscopic images that I've traditionally used. Along um, with the pre-op plan, and the, 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 plan, the images are just confirming what you know from the pre-operative planning. Correct. Uh, in terms of what I've learned in doing these procedures, uh, I think there are a couple of things. Um, uh, one is what I mentioned in my, power, in my uh, talk, which is, uh, these screws are large in diameter, and so they can, once the screw is placed, it can obscure your uh, further imaging. So I think, again, a, a better preoperative plan in terms of uh, placing wires or, or sizing your screws, uh, getting your imaging necessary before placing that first screw is going to be critical because um, if, if there's overlap, it's really hard to see. Uh, unlike uh, traditional cannulated screws where you have the, the radial lucency of the um, cannulation as well as uh, their smaller diameter, so you have more opportunity to visualize. Um, I think the other thing that I have learned is, is when you start to steer these wires, it's easy to carve a path. These wires are actually uh, surprisingly um, uh, stout, uh, and so uh, if you're not careful, you can start to, to take that wire into a direction, um, then you have to then bring it back and correct it, so I think that's the other thing that I've learned. Dr. Gary, anything to add? I think tonight we're talking a lot about challenges with uh, osteopenic and osteoporotic bone. I think the challenges with the flexible guide wire can really be seen in the younger quality bone too, uh, especially as the sacrum has, you know, different bone densities in different parts. Um, and, you know, I've seen in, in younger bone, uh, if you're using these kind of implants, you may need to ream to create a path and then start advancing it again, especially through the central sacrum, because you can see the wire will get stopped up sometimes. So, so just paying attention. I think the frequent imaging, uh, like everyone's talked about, to watch it, watch a screw dock and also to watch the path of the wire because correcting an errant path can be difficult. Uh, but you know, I found that a reamer, uh, a reamer to the point you're at and then start advancing again can help you if you're running into good bone quality uh, that's uh, limiting your wire advancing. Have you know, the Dr. Gardner, in your situation, there was this, uh, we're going to go back to the reamer again. We've just uh, got information uh, from the product manufacturer of the reamer that um, it, they don't recommend that it go in oscillating mode. So uh, that would be, yeah, we would maybe <laughs> tapping it carefully, we can accept, but the oscillation the manufacturers don't. Uh, recommend and so we'd want to make sure our audience knows that uh, tonight as well from a safety standard. Yeah. Are there any specific views, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, that you're using besides the, the tangential inlet with a 15 degree uh, rollover or the rollover adjusted according to the preoperative plan of what that obliquity is? Are there other 
images that you found that are particularly helpful during the application of the curve affix that you might not use when you're just doing straight iliosacral screws? I don't think there's anything um, different. I think, you know, we're pretty much using standard inlet outlet um, lateral and slightly oblique views, just like we would with straight screws. Uh, I think we probably use a little more imaging uh, with the C-arm because uh, we're trying to direct that, that flexible wire around a curve. And uh, I think the other point that was made earlier, I agree with is if you, if you start hitting it in the wrong direction, because you've turned your T-handle the wrong way, you can create a path and you have to back up quite a bit to get it going in the right direction. Um, so I think switching between views uh, frequently is, is helpful. Yeah, I, it's uh, similar to doing bilateral screws um, and the, the, the extra views are, I think, real necessary in order to keep the, the surgeon uh, and the, of course the patient very safe. Yeah. Dr. Mehta, any other comments to make about the, uh, the curve of fix experiences that you've had besides just the patient you presented tonight? You're still on mute. You have to backtrack because you're on the mute. Yeah, that doesn't actually help. Um, I've done the implant uh, predominantly in patients who required immediate weight bearing for a variety of reasons, whether it was a uh, social uh, or um, uh, physiologic, uh, particularly in the osteoporotic patients. And so um, I've been relatively aggressive, more so than I would be uh, with traditional um, ilio screw fixation with cannulated screws or smaller diameter screws. Um, and uh, similar to Josh's experience, I, I have not had, at least thus far, I have not had an issue with um, implant failure or um, screw backing out. Uh, now, these are relatively low demand individuals. Uh, we're not asking them to do a lot, uh, as the woman I showed as she's walking still with a walker. Um, but uh, I, have, uh, I have been more aggressive uh, than I would traditionally uh, have been uh, with traditional fixation. One of the things that no one showed tonight was uh, the displaced or the, uh, the fracture through the greater notch up to the ilium or the an iliac fracture that's unstable. And this population has a propensity to have ili unstable iliac fractures. Often the crest um, is uh, comminuted a little bit. Uh, and so it makes it difficult to get secure fixation of the iliac crest. And the pelvic brim conduit becomes a, a fairly reliable place for this. This is a fairly large conduit of bone or a large osseous fixation pathway typically, and it has not a lot of curvature to it, but it does, especially uh, toward the posterior iliac area, have some curvature uh, toward it. And I, I wonder if uh, any of y'all have used the uh, curvafix for a pelvic brim or a, what some people call this an LC2 screw application where the, the implant is applied from the anterior inferior iliac spine contained uh, with uh, under the internal iliac cortical bone uh, within the pathway just above the greater sciatic notch toward the posterior to treat unstable iliac fractures. Dr. Gardner, I'll start with you. You're on mute, Dr. Gardner. Yeah, I'm getting there. Uh, no, I, I, haven't, I haven't used it for that yet. Okay, Dr. Gary. Yeah, I used it in a younger patient uh, with a, a sacroiliac joint fracture dislocation. Uh, it actually came back uh, near the SI joint where I could get SI screws uh, at S1 um, that would secure that back to the sacrum. But then I augmented uh, with, the, with the rod screw and curve affix and in the posterior ring was able to navigate around those screws. You know, those screws had the more demanding, you know, osseous fixation pathway for transsacral transiliac fixation or that vector. Uh, but the rod screw was able to accommodate around them Again, it was good quality bones, so there were a couple challenges with creating the tunnel, but we were able uh, near the back of the ring to, to curve that around the screws that we had to stabilize the, uh, the iliac fracture dislocation. I'll just stay in alphabetical order, Dr. Hutchinson. I haven't used it for that application yet, but it seems ideal. Um, yeah. You know, I agree with you that that's a great corridor for it and that straight screws don't always get as ba far back as you'd like to. Yeah. Dr. Meadow? I would echo uh, Hank's comments and your comments. I think this corridor is, is larger than we 
realized. When I say we, I think if you really look at it, it is a, it is a fairly uh, large quarter. You can get multiple screws in. Um, I have not done it with the Curvifix, but I suspect that uh, the Curvifix could be used for that uh, LC2 pattern. Yeah, I think the, the you know, we, we were beating it up for its diameter in the Ramus earlier for being too much. And I think in this situation for this conduit, it would be really uh, perfect for that, that application. And I, I wouldn't want to end the session without at least uh, talking about that or some of the other applications through the iliac uh, area and things like that. Or we, we know we never talked about even the posterior column from an ischial up uh, application as well. And that's a whole nother, another realm. So I, I think we're uh, getting close to our time limit, and I want to make sure that uh, if other panelists have anything else to say, and then uh, Steve, I'd like you to uh, make some final comments, at least as just bring us up to date as far as just the, the availability and uh, the, the horizon uh, things of, uh, from the product development aspect of this uh, before we close. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm glad to. First, I want to say thank you, Chip, and thank you all the panelists. And you know, we wouldn't be able to do this without you all. So, so your help is always appreciative. And, uh, you know, where we're at as a company, we've treated 55 patients to date. Uh, Dr. Gardner did patient 55 today. And, uh, you know, we have, um, we have a limited set of sets, but, but we have uh, sufficient amounts. We have 18 surgeons who've done the procedure to date. And, uh, you know, where we're at, our instruments are really kind of transitioning to our, um, we, we call it 2.0, so they're being more refined. Uh, those will be out kind of mid-year. It kind of happens with all orthopedic companies. We learn, we adapt, and we go. And, you know, I'm really excited about the smaller implant, too. Um, the current one is a 9.5 millimeter major diameter. The new one is, uh, or the smaller one is a 7.5 uh, diameter major. Uh, we should have that um, kind of late this year. So we're uh, just getting ready to do some testing and and uh, Dr. Rout, looking forward to personally uh, doing a cadaver study with you, as we've talked about over the years. And uh, and I think that's it. We're we're um, we're really excited. It's it's been a lot of great progress, and we're just really thankful we can help all these patients and appreciate everybody's help. So thank you. One of the thing that Dr. Gary brings up uh, in the chat is, and I think he has a recent publication about this with Dr. Goslin is the use of the hyper inlet to uh, image the canal. Dr. Gary, you want to just uh, come off mute and mention that uh, to, or tell people where they can go read about it? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's pre or published uh, ahead of print on JOT online uh, right now. But it's if you look at it, I mean, Chip had the image of the sagittal view earlier with the displacement. But on average, if, if you want to look at the at the spinal canal, it's on average 17 degrees more of inlet. It varies patient to patient but it can be a way to kind of see your posterior limit uh, in, the, in the first and second sacral segments if you don't have a displaced transverse component, uh, but it can just give you, a, give you a feel for how posterior you need to be. You know, I've found with even standard screws, if you're doing that second screw cranial and posterior, it can be really helpful to let you know how posterior you can go and what you need to avoid. Uh, but I'll use that with the Curvifix as well, especially in a dysmorph uh, to help me see that posterior limit and how much I can how, how far I can take it posterior in that upper sacral segment. Yeah, it's really important to remember when you're looking at that view to also remember the takeoff of the tunnels from the canal. And so whenever we get back into that zone, you want to make sure you really understand how the tunnel, uh, essentially the chutes are coming out of the canal and into the bone, because that can be extremely variable for people. And so while you may be in front of the canal, you may be in the tunnel takeoff area. So that would be a really important point uh, for people to remember when they get back into that posterior half of the vertebral body, depending on where they are, high or low, you know. Especially yeah, caudal, right, Chip? Especially yeah, Dr. if they're caudal yeah, with, Dr. The, with the canal. Dr. Meta, you look like you had something you wanted to say. No, I, I would agree with you. It, it uh, this this is where I think really studying your CT scan is critical, and then using as much information as you can sort of access intraoperatively, understanding your fluoroscopic images, utilizing some of the quote unquote newer views that are out there to really understand where you're going. And what Josh was saying, which was if you are too caudal with your start point, that's a, that's definitely a risk. So I just want to close with uh, saying, Doctor Doctor Gary and I are actually at a 
pelvic course that starts tomorrow. And I want you all to know there are these courses that go through and you know, I have a lab tomorrow where we'll spend uh, several hours going through the, the imaging intraoperatively on cadavers and also preoperative planning and things like that. So if, if you have concerns about the planning or things like that, or you can't really get it out of the things that you've read and you don't have uh, courses uh, sometimes, so especially uh, experience courses are, I think, really good for um, getting that information that you need or just going to visit, you know, someone that, that does it a lot. Sometimes just a week or two with someone that does it a lot can help uh, really clarify a lot of the details. But those are things that um, I, I think are important to, to end with tonight. So we're, we're right on the tail end of our time. And so, Steve, if you have other things to say, uh, let me know. And if you don't, then I think we're going to um, end our session. I just, again, thanks again. We really appreciate everybody's help and contributions and look forward to helping a lot more patients together. So thanks a lot. And to you, Chip, thank you so much for, for sharing again. Really and appreciate it. I appreciate the faculty participating and in, in, in being with us tonight and all the participants. Thanks for joining on and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers for an excellent program. And most importantly, thank you to all of our attendees for participating in this evening's program. On behalf of Curvifix and today's panel of experts, be safe and stay well.